And it's interesting because there's probably many people wandering around who have never set foot in a church or probably even heard the Bible read, and yet they probably know the story of the Good Samaritan. The teaching of this gospel is very, very clear. Our neighbor, our neighbor is anyone, absolutely anyone who needs our help. And therefore, it's a difficult gospel. It's one that many of us stumble over all the time. Like the lawyer in the gospel today who asks, who is my neighbor? We too, at least I know I do, always try to dial that comfort dial to in the gospel down to make this story a more manageable, a more palatable story for me. And I gotta say, because I'm looking out over at the lawyers over there, these lawyers there, these were lawyers of the law. They weren't like you fine, upstanding members of the bar. I want to be real clear about that. And anybody else out here is a lawyer. So different kinds, so don't feel like you're on the hook. In fact, I identify with this guy. Because he wants to kind of find, he wants to make this hard saying easier. And the lawyer probably assumed that Jesus shared the common understanding of a proverb that was prevalent at the time of Jesus that went, love your neighbors, hate your enemies. In fact, some of you might recall that in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus quotes that proverb. He says, you have heard it said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now Luke doesn't have Jesus quoting that proverb, but certainly this parable of the Good Samaritan undermines that proverb completely. Because we see in this parable that the Samaritan, who was clearly not viewed by the lawyer or any other good Jew as a neighbor, in fact, viewed as an enemy, is the one who acts like a neighbor. And the answer to the question of the lawyer, who is my neighbor, comes from, of all people, the one that they do not consider a neighbor. So it is one of these stories that just is tough for people to handle. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus, often seems to push us, don't you think? It often seems to push you and me to do something more than we might be inclined to do. It asks us to go the extra mile. It asks us to give our coat to someone who is cold and can't afford one. It asks us to be generous with our money and not attach a bunch of strings to it. It asks us to extend hospitality and care to the stranger and to care for the least of these. The Gospel reminds us that the mercy that we're asked to have is more than a feeling, right? The mercy that we are ha to have really is some sort of action. It involves shifting our paths. It involves stopping. It involves crossing the road and dropping our business as usual in order to help someone. Now, I think it's important to remember that this Samaritan was most likely a businessman, and he had plenty to do. He had just as much to do, if not more to do, than the priest and the Levite, both very important religious folk, mind you. And yet he was the one who stopped his business, who went to the side of the road and took care of this man and got him on a horse and to safety. I find it interesting in the story that the lawyer asks Jesus, what must he do to inherit eternal life? And if you listen to that story again, Jesus never answers that question. He never says, if you do this, you're going to get a ticket to heaven. Rather, he says, 
do this and live. He says, do this and you will live. He's saying that loving God and loving our neighbor is really how people experience life in the fullest sense. It's how a person begins to get in touch with their humanity. This is how we live, by going out of our way for someone else. Often when we hear this story, or at least when I hear it, I immediately put myself in the role of one of the people who comes across the Samaritan. Would I stop? Or would I walk by? I guess maybe I do it because, you know, the two guys that go right by him, they're religious folk, you know, professional types like me. And they're the characters that just zip right by. And so maybe that's why I find myself struggling. Would I have stopped or not? The story doesn't tell us much about this man lying in the ditch at all. But it's safe to assume that he was a Jew. Now, think about it. Think about what it must have been like for him. Have you thought about what it must have been like for him lying there? There he was. Imagine him beaten and bloodied and lying in the dirt, his face swollen, the taste, that metallic and salty taste of blood oozing out of his mouth, the pain that it occurred when he just tried to breathe because his ribs were so broken. And there he was, the story tells us, half dead, probably thinking he is going to die. And then all of a sudden he hears some footsteps coming down the path. And through his blurred vision, he recognizes a familiar dress, a robe. It's a priest. And he probably groaned, I'm going to be saved. And as he was lying there, all of a sudden he noticed those steps seemed to go off in the distance. And once again, he was lying in silence, in pain. 